thank you all for being here. Before I start, and this will embarrass him, but stand behind you is Chris Saunders, who last night, uh, as we were closing up shop in the U.S. Senate, the Senate unanimously confirmed him uh, for the Northern Region. Give me the exact title, Chris. Northern Border Region Commission. Commission. So he will uh, he will be leaving our office and doing that, and I think it's very very helpful to those of us in the northern states. And also along with it, and we're doing this, of course, to make sure that Chris has some money to spend. Uh, Congress passed a bipartisan, in, which is rare in the Senate, omnibus spending bill. So a lot of investments for the country, particularly in Vermont. Now, as chair of the Appropriations Committee, I can bring back congressionally corrected spending, which allows us to have some say, and local authorities like mayors and governors can have some say in how the money is spent. And so as he wrote the appropriations bills, I had that seat in the table, but I was, I had a double whammy because I had Senator Sanders, chair of the budget committee who was working on this, and Congressman Welch, who was, uh, had his own things in the House bill and was tracking every single thing we do. Uh, I received something like 300 requests from Vermont for areas of helping. I looked at the projects that help Vermont families, Vermont communities, Vermont's economy in the years to come. And with the uh, result of those requests I got from Vermonters, I can announce we have $167 million going to be invested to projects to help revitalize downtowns, train workers, lasting infrastructure, uh, but also looking after the most vulnerable among us. Uh, and right here at the uh, Vermont airport, we're investing in projects to improve the uh, passenger experience for the traveling public, expand the workforce, but also make Vermont easier and more accessible. But we also have provided young people the opportunity to study aviation and high-tech manufacturing, something that's going to prepare them for the jobs that they're going to want to have as they get older. We have money to help recruit nurses, and I have a special fondness for, <laughs> for nurses. I have been married to one for 60 years, but we also have projects will help adults who are entering the workforce. It's, um, we need more skilled workers, but then we got to make sure they're there. I want those to be Vermonters, and we'll train each of, uh, each of them. And these are worthy projects. We can go through all of them, but I'd like to yield to, to uh, You're going to yield the floor to me? For unanimous consent. No, you know, I, you know, what we're joking about is I was presiding yesterday afternoon and I was so distracted, you unanimous consent, distracted by somebody and they, they said, well, they're about to uh, recess and the uh, majority leader stands up and I said, okay, he goes like this. He's like, oh, I said the senator from Vermont yeah. is recognized. And so the well, senator from Vermont was recognized. And thank you for recognizing me again. Uh, let me just begin by saying that uh, being chairman of the Senate Appropriations Committee, uh, especially in these very partisan times, is not an easy job. Uh, and I want to congratulate Senator Leahy, chair of that committee, and his staff uh, for working really, really hard uh, in passing a strong uh, $1.5 trillion federal budget. Not an easy task. Congratulations. Yeah. Uh, one of the distinctive initiatives in this budget, as the Senator mentioned, was the reemergence of earmarks, now referred to as congressionally directed spending. Now, over the years, there has been a lot of criticisms of these earmarks, but I disagree. Congressionally directed funds are part of a very democratic process. 
And what it means is that I and my staff and Senator Leahy and Congressman Welch and their staff can go out around the state, talk to people from one end of Vermont to other, get a sense of what their needs are and do our best uh, to fund those needs. And obviously uh, we have our office, as I'm sure Senator Leahy and Congressman Welch as well, received hundreds and hundreds of very strong requests. Clearly uh, we could not fund all of them, but I'm proud of what we were able uh, to do. Uh, as I think many people know over the years, we have made some really good progress in our state in responding to the crisis of dental care. Uh, the truth is that dental care is far too expensive and many working families and their kids are unable uh, to go to a dentist when they need to. Uh, in this earmark process, we have provided over three million dollars to community health centers and other entities to expand access to affordable dental care, which is what community health centers provide. Uh, we have also put a special emphasis on bringing dental care into the schools. We started a project here in Burlington a number of years ago, enormously successful. We're spreading that all over the state. So we're going to bring dental chairs into schools. Uh, I don't have to tell any working class parent uh, in Vermont that childcare is outrageously expensive. On average, it costs about $15,000. I'm proud that in this process we have funded new child care slots uh, throughout Vermont. Obviously, we have a long, long way to go. This is a national crisis. I hope at the federal level we can do something about it. I think we're making some progress here in the state. Once again, another crisis issue in Vermont and in America is the need for affordable housing. Uh, and as a result of this process, I'm proud that we have brought millions of dollars uh, into the state for more affordable housing and to improve our existing housing stock. Uh, in the midst of climate change, it goes without saying that we want Vermont to be a leader in transforming our energy system away from fossil fuel into energy efficiency and sustainable energy. Part of what we brought into the state will provide funding for 20 public entities, 10 schools, 10 public buildings to move from fossil fuel to solar energy. Uh, as a longtime uh, member of the Veterans Committee, uh, I wanted to make sure that we were able to support our military community and working with Senator Leahy and Congressman Welch, we were able to uh, bring forth substantial sums of, fun of funding for a new family center uh, at Camp Johnson. And this is something that our National Guard has long wanted and I'm proud to have worked with the Senator and Congressman Welch uh, to make that happen. Uh, last but not least, I wanted to mention a program uh, that we have fought for that may be unique in this country. We waste taxpayer money when people who are released from prison uh, fail on the outside and once again become incarcerated. The rate of recidivism in this state and in this country is just too high. And one of the reasons for that is that many of the people in prison simply don't have the education and the skills to succeed on the outside. And I'm proud that working with Vermont Community Colleges, uh, we will be funding educational programs in every prison in the state from remedial reading to college education. But we have done something unique here, which I think does not exist around the rest of the country. We know, and many of you know, that our corrections offices have been under incredible pressure in the last couple of years because of COVID. They're understaffed, they're overworked, and what we have said to them is that we are going to help them get the free higher education that they need through community college as well. So in this proposal, not only provides educational opportunities for uh, people in the, the correction uh, institutions, but also for the correction officers as well. So uh, that is some of what we have done. I want to thank uh, Senator Leahy again uh, for his leadership on this issue. Thank you, Barry. Congressman Welch, Senator, we all work together on this because we may be the second smallest state in the country, but we won't just have the biggest clout. <laughs> Go ahead, Peter. Well, speaking of big clout, Chairman of the Appropriations Committee right here. <laughs> We've been blessed in Vermont. Chairman of the Budget Committee right here. Uh, Patrick and Bernie, it's really, really wonderful to be here. You know, I want to say a couple of things. Number one, uh, with all the rancor in Washington, there's, in fact, things that are actually getting done and to some extent on a bipartisan basis. We haven't had a budget 
in how many years? And Patrick, uh, you working with Senator Shelby uh, managed to get a budget. And that is good in every way possible because it gives clarity uh, to all our governmental agencies about what they can expect, what they can count on, they can plan and they can manage. And uh, it is not in the minds of uh, everyday people that that's a big deal uh, because they do it with their checkbook every month but in, in Congress it is a big deal and Senator Leahy I want to congratulate you uh, and Senator Sanders for the role you played as chair of the budget committee in getting that done because it really does make a difference for planning and execution uh, the second thing is I want to <clears throat> say something about uh, earmarks which Bernie started talking about you know th this appropriation process in the Constitution belongs to Congress in Congress, each of us is elected by the people and we're subject to their vote. And the appropriations process in the Constitution starts in the Congress. And congressionally di directed spending is a judgment by members of Congress who are accountable to our voters about how to spend taxpayer dollars. And in these congressionally directed spending, all of these have to be for a public purpose Everything has to be totally transparent, and we have to sign our name next to anything that we're advocating for. And Patrick has been extraordinary uh, with his uh, 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 seniority and his role as the chair of the Appropriations Committee, uh, the same with Bernie. Uh, and I had the opportunity in the House, likewise, to sign my name and advocate on behalf of Vermont for specific projects. And I'm just going to name a couple because they're small, but they're emblematic of what I think is so essential. We have been hammered by COVID. It has been exhausting for everybody, and we've done a great job, especially in Vermont, where folks have gotten vaccinated, they've gotten their booster, where people cooperate because they want to be healthy, not just for their own well-being, because we know in Vermont we have an obligation to our neighbor as well. But with all of the money that came to help us, uh, individuals, money for the vaccine, money for uh, the payroll protection plan to help our businesses, there was another goal here. And the goal was to try to help our communities and our local institutions survive COVID along with individuals. And I'm just gonna mention two of the proposals that were included uh, that were among the ones that I advocated for because they're emblematic of how hard Vermonters work and how I think each of us feels very privileged to be able to help Vermonters who are helping their own communities. One is only $200,000, you know, in congressional terms, that's a small amount. But if you live in East Callis, Vermont, that is a lot of money. And the folks there with their housing trust got together to save the, the local general store. And those general stores are mainstays of our local communities all around rural Vermont. And by getting together, they were able with privately raised funds and the appropriation to save that store and also on the upstairs of the store to convert it into three housing units. That matters in a small community like East Callis, Vermont. Another one is in Derby, Vermont, right up on the Canadian border. It's tough up there, especially with the closure of the border. That's been an added challenge for those folks. You know what they want? They want a park. They want a park. And Mayor, you understand this. That's really important people in a local community. And they raise money, they have high property taxes, but they were able also through this budget to get $517,000 to help build a new park. And you know what that is, what's so exciting to me about that? It's like people who live there and who love Derby are now able to improve Derby for the neighbors and for their children. And that's what government should be about, helping folks who have the energy to help themselves, helping folks who deeply, deeply care about their own communities, deeply, deeply care about the things the people in their community need. So uh, it was just tremendous working with uh, Patrick and Bernie, uh, and it's so good that we're able, I think, uh, to play a small role in helping folks who are working an awful lot harder than anyone else uh, to build a town park, to keep that general store going, to create three affordable housing units. 
And that's what government should be about, helping people who are trying to help themselves and help their communities. Thank you. Mayor? Well, good afternoon, everyone. It is um, really exciting to be here with Vermont's incredible federal delegation, kind of uh, representing uh, Vermont localities in a, in a sense. And uh, let me start by saying, uh, and I feel confident in saying that Vermont's mayors and local officials are pro earmarks as well. We are we are for <laughs> congressionally directed spending. And uh, but let me be serious. You know, let me say why. Um, I it's hard for me to believe. I've been in this office almost 10 years now, and for the first eight years, uh, we really had very few of these conversations about how local government and the federal government can work together to improve the lives of uh, Burlingtonians. They're just um, there these this form of funding had gone away and there are very few other ways that federal government could directly help um, uh, local governments in, in meeting our biggest challenges. Um, we are exactly two years from when that changed almost overnight uh, with the arrival of COVID in this country. I'll never forget the early days of the pandemic sitting in the emergency operations center at the police department. We had the television on. We, had, we were watching you guys on the Senate floor and the House floor as you passed these historic pieces of uh, legislation that um, directly uh, brought uh, assistance. We knew help was coming as we dealt with the early stages uh, of, of the pandemic. That continued, um, uh, of course, later with uh, additional with additional COVID relief bills and then the ARPA bill. It continued um, with the federal infrastructure bill that is uh, directly helping us one of one of our major challenges as a as a city with aging infrastructure um, and with this bill the omnibus uh, spending bill um, I'm hopeful this is an indication that that this era isn't isn't ending just as it, as COVID comes to an end that this direct relationship between local government um, and the and, and the federal government is going to continue and really with this bill we are able to take on um, some of our biggest challenges and let me just talk about uh, three of the ways in which uh, Burlington is directly benefiting from um, this this bill and the announcements announcements today. Um, one is uh, with our economic challenges. The airport and the Church Street Marketplace are two of the uh, largest city-owned economic uh, engines in this region. And um, part of the reason that we are having this event at the airport is the airport is going to get seven million dollars of uh, federal funding as a result um, of. Uh, our, our federal delegation and, and Senator Leahy has had a particular uh, interest in the airport for many years and we're very grateful for that focus. And um, five of that seven million, I, I'm happy to say, is going to help build the new airport infrastructure necessary for Beta to um, build a manufacturing uh, facility for electric airplanes here um, uh, in uh, at the airport. And this, so this could end up being a very important piece of the, the region's economic future. Another million dollars is going to the rebuilding the Church Street Marketplace. Anyone who's been down there recently knows that after 40 years of uh, incredible success, there are elements of the marketplace that are getting um, a bit worn out. The bricks themselves in places uh, need replacement. This is gonna help us refresh the marketplace and keep that a vibrant part of Burlington's uh, economic um, future. Um, we, uh, people who have been following local events know that one of our highest priorities right now is uh, dealing with our acute housing challenge. And there are many aspects of that challenge. Um, one of them is that we are, we have made a commitment uh, to do everything we can to end homelessness over the next three years. We are created a new position, a special assistant to end homelessness, who's will be starting shortly. Um, and we are opening, as has been in the news, this new shelter pod community that is co-located with a community resource center, a place where, our, where some of our most vulnerable uh, Burlingtonians will be able to access um, resources and, and help and, and uh, have a whole array of opportunities for, presented there. Um, in this bill is $400,000 to help us build that community resource center uh, in the coming months. Um, and then, um, um, finally, I want to point out one of uh, Burlington's biggest priorities for many years now uh, during my time has been to be moved towards becoming a net zero energy city to essentially um, cut our dependence on uh, and use of fossil fuels uh, over the next decade. The biggest single thing that we can do 
uh, to achieve that goal. Um, this, and I want to be clear about this is largest like single intervention. The biggest thing we can do is all to move towards electrification. Is everyone to get electric vehicles and, and move towards uh, electric heat. Um, but the single biggest action will be if we can claim the waste heat from the uh, McNeil generating facility and use it to heat UVM and the U University of Vermont Medical Center. This is something the city has been working, I believe going all the way back to, to the time when you were mayor. Uh, uh, Senator, uh, it's been something, it's been kind of a, a Gordian knot that we've had great difficulty cutting. There's $5 million uh, in this bill to help us uh, finally achieve that goal as well and take a huge step towards becoming a net zero city. So I hope, uh, I hope those examples, I'm sure those are, you know, I don't know the budgets of uh, all 250 municipalities and exactly how every community is being um, helped, but I hope and believe those are illustrative of the direct ways in which what our federal delegation has done and led here um, is going to provide direct uh, assistance to um, municipalities and local communities on some of their biggest challenges. Thanks for the chance to be here with the three of you. I thank, thank everybody you. for thank you. chiming in because it does involve all of us. And just as a, a note, I started meetings yesterday with the key Republicans and Democrats on the Senate Appropriations Committee. And we're going to start very soon, within a matter of, uh, a ma we're going to start very soon, and actually within a matter of weeks, the key Republicans, key Democrats will sit down together. We're going to start putting together uh, next year's budgets that have to be passed by um, September, end of September, and uh, I intend to do it. So I'm also encouraging, and I know Senator Sanders and Congressman Moats are encouraging groups in Vermont, let us know the areas you need, but let us know areas that will make life better for Vermonters and will help in all the different ways. So that I'll hush up if anybody has a question of any of the uh, four of us up here, go ahead. How did Vermont do per capita? <laughs> um, we're one of the two or three highest per capita in the, in the country. Amazing coincidence. This <laughs> question for the I've I've had a few uh, a few senators from much larger states point that out. I said, yeah, but we're a better state. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, this, this question is for the entire delegation. Uh, you've probably seen the reporting from CBS News and the Washington Post about text between Mark Meadows, Trump's chief of staff, and uh, the wife of Justice Clarence Thomas. I was just wondering if any of you would uh, wish that Justice Thomas had recused himself from any cases about the 2020 election, and whether you think he should resign from his position as a justice on the court. I have so many thoughts on this as a member of the Senate Judiciary Committee. I would just remind some of the senators who were hypocritical in their attacks at Judge Jackson this week, uh, hypocritical attacks that were racist, misogynist, and unprecedented. And yet you will not hear a single one of them suggest that Clarence Thomas did anything wrong. <clears throat> They've got to realize there should not be double standards. And when somebody like Ted Cruz condemns the nomination of one of the most qualified, one of the most qualified people I've seen in 48 years, he said, but this sends a terrible message to qualified white men to have this black woman. It is probably the worst misogynist, misogynistic racist thing I've heard, and I've heard some over the years. And that's why I, I normally don't. But in the hearings, when he's going on, I remind him that he may be wanting to get some sound bites on TV. I said, I remind the junior senator from Texas that we have rules here, and everybody's expected to follow them, and he wasn't. And I'll leave it at that. Senator Leahy. Sorry. along those lines with uh, Judge Jackson. How important was today's announcement by Senator Manchin that he is supporting 
her nomination to the Supreme uh, Court. Well, that that was important, but I've also talked to a number of Republicans who know that she's immensely qualified. Anybody who listened to her, anybody who looked at her record, anybody who's seen what she's done, she has been the best of the best at every single step. It should be automatic. I voted on 21 Supreme Court justices. The first one was John Paul Stevens, seen as a conservative Republican nominated by a conservative Republican president. His hearing debate took about three days, and he was voted out unanimously. I voted for him, and I never regretted that vote. Others have. It is, I've argued that if we want to turn the nomination process into a heightened partisan debate, especially one with racial overtones uh, and anti-women overtones like this one, that is going to so damage all our court system. Uh, Peter and I have argued a lot of cases and for trial courts and appellate courts. I don't think we ever went to a court and said, well, yeah, but this judge is Republican or Democrat. We always figured, well, we've got good judges. They're going to make up their mind based on the case. I'll either win or I'll lose uh, based on the case. People need that faith in their courts. And the kind of things we saw this past week just damages that. It'll take long time to put it back. Let me just add a word. I had the opportunity uh, a couple of weeks ago to meet with Judge Jackson, and she is a very, very impressive uh, person. And I think the behavior of some of our right-wing Republican colleagues in attacking her uh, was absolutely disgraceful. Uh, I think it was racist, and I think it was sexist. Uh, and I think it sends a very, very bad message uh, throughout this country. Uh, but I am confident uh, that uh, we will have the support, I think, of virtually all Democrats, and I think we'll have some Republicans, and I think that she will soon become the next uh, Justice of the United States Supreme Court. Senators, the other big issue, obviously, that everybody is watching is Ukraine, and I'm curious if you would support a no-fly zone, and if not, what options do you support for further helping the Ukrainians? Let me just say a word on that. Obviously, I think all of us are shocked, and I think it's hard to describe my feelings. I, I dream about this stuff, literally. Mm -hmm. uh, the horror that's going on in the Ukraine right now, Putin's totally unjustified war, uh, bombing, buildings, killing innocent civilians, uh, it, is, it is outrageous uh, beyond words. Uh, I do not support a no-fly zone. I think what President, President Biden is trying to do is walk a very tight line, and it's very difficult. And I know it's easy to criticize, but it's very difficult. Does anybody in their right mind want to see World War III? Does anybody in their right mind want to see a nuclear war? We don't. So our job now is to do everything that we can to defend Ukrainian people to get them all of the military and humanitarian resources that they need to deal with one of the other tragedies of what's going on. They have millions and millions of people have been driven from their homes, going to Poland, going to other countries. People have been displaced within their country. Something like one quarter, including millions of children, have been forced to leave their homes. So we've got to do everything we can to defend the Ukrainian people. We ought to do everything we can to isolate Russia. We ought to do everything we can to defeat this oligarchy of Putin and his friends. But I think uh, I speak for virtually everybody in saying we don't want another world war. We don't want a nuclear war. And I think the president is handling this as effectively as he can by uniting uh, all of our allies around the world uh, to protect uh, Ukraine and isolate Russia. I think um, there's a very distinguished Republican senator who <clears throat> about the time I was poor, so the politics should stop at the at the uh, uh, 
we're at, at the edge of uh, where the oceans begin and where our land ends. And, you know, I see some of the people have taken to the floor criticizing Joe Biden, and they voted against the money for Ukraine. Mm -hmm. What a hypocritical stance. We should be, just as the Ukrainians are uniting, we should be united in our support <clears throat> with them. I applaud the president and all the work he's done, much of which has not been reported, but the hours upon hours upon hours of meetings by Zoom, by phone, in person with our leaders in, in uh, NATO, bringing them together in a way we have not seen in decades. Germany upping their budget, uh, Switzerland joining Finland, Japan, all of these. I don't think Putin expected that, but it didn't stop Putin from being really a war criminal. And some of the people in there who are bombing hospitals, <clears throat> children's playgrounds, shooting families in the street, shooting them dead in the street. This is, these are war crimes. I've walked down the streets of Kiev. I've seen families bringing their children to a playground, kids laughing and having such a good time. And it's similar to what we've done with our children and our grandchildren here in Vermont and elsewhere. And then I see what's happening there. It's war crime. I'm glad the president's in Poland. Um, I'm having a meeting in Brussels in another month with our NATO allies, see where we are at that point. I'm anxious to hear what the president has to say when he comes back. I'm being very careful not to say anything that would let any daylight between well, in this case, the president pro tempore. After all, I am third in line, the presidency. I'm not, and I get the same briefings he does. I'm not going to say anything that's going to put me at odds with the president. I don't think anybody else could have brought our NATO allies together with such force. I think that totally surprised Putin. After all, Putin was used to dealing with Donald Trump who called him a genius, even after he started the murderous uh, things he was doing. Do we know how many, uh, the Biden administration says 100,000 uh, uh, Ukrainians will be coming into the United States, accepting that. Do we have any idea if any will be coming to Vermont? Or is this I expect some will come to, the question was, do we have any of the Ukrainians come to the U.S., some will come to Vermont. I would not be surprised. You know, Vermont has been, mm -hmm on a per capita basis, probably more receptive to uh, refugees than any state in this country. Certainly the mayor knows that in his own city. Look at the number of languages you hear going through the stores and, and the schools. Uh, but I also suspect there's going to be more than 100,000. What I would like to do, and I'm sure the Ukrainians like to see, stability and peace so they can go back to whatever is left of their homes. I'll just say, certainly, Senators, Congressman, Burlington would be happy to pl Great. play a role in, you know, in doing more. You, know, you read these stories in Moldova, one of the poorest countries in Europe, 90% of the refugees there are being housed in people's homes. I think there are many communities here in America that would like to do more. I agree with that. Yeah. Okay. Have we solved all the problems of the world? Yeah. You realize I just go down there and do whatever Bernie and Peter tell me to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah.